and uh, my deep gratitude to all of you for joining this uh, morning uh, or maybe evening for some people and also for potentially watching this as a recording. I have received some positive feedback from our previous uh, recorded session, which made me very happy to be doing this because it's always nice to uh, discuss these profound points in general, but especially lovely when they seem familiar to someone where people express their appreciation or when there's some thinking process going uh, on in all of us, uh, inspiring us to contemplate these points deeply, not because I have anything of value to offer from my side, but because these are all points that are related to capital D Dharma, and therefore they are beneficial in general, and in particular, potentially beneficial in the domain of our environmental existence, which is the topic of our conversation here in a way. So uh, as an invitation for all of us, including myself, it's always lovely to begin with a little bit of uh, relaxation and with a practice for establishing positive motivation for what we're about to do. So I would invite us all to do this little meditation by finding a comfortable stationary position and first returning to the body, finding a comfortable way to arrange the parts of the body so that that so that together they become sort of a supportive mandala, a supportive arrangement of the natural elements that would hold us in place, allowing our body to experience deeper levels of ease, stillness, and vigilance while our mind is approaching. The similar qualities of relaxation, stability, and clarity. And so we can bring our awareness to the sensations in the body, noticing especially the parts of the body that are currently in contact with the ground. Noticing the sensations in those areas, the experience of being in contact with the firmness and stability underneath us. Releasing muscle tension in those areas, if possible, or simply noticing that it exists. And allowing our breath to move naturally without any control from our side as we explore experiences in our feet and toes. in the area of our pelvic floor. Around our hands and fingers. in our shoulders, and in our facial muscles. Softening them to the degree that's available to us to simply rest with curiosity towards the changing experiences of the body. the dance of the tactile sensations in this interconnected field of energy.
with our body resting in this manner, we can use our mind to formulate, establish a vast and positive motivation, a positive or constructive motivation that would be at the same time both vast and profound. Vast in that it encompasses the benefit of multiple beings, not at all limited to ourselves or even to the realm of humans. And profound because it would be related to the more profound types of happiness, not limited to simply the hedonic pleasure derived from sensory stimulation. If we're able to establish profound types of well-being, it would naturally be connected to our generous attempts at preserving the natural environment, enhancing its sustainability. Inner well-being would naturally manifest as nonviolence towards ourselves other humans, other species in our shared environment. So in this way, may we be able to realize our profound potential so as to bring the greatest possible benefit to all. And the explore, exploration that we're going to undertake together will allow us to consider some ideas to see whether there's anything in particular that we might want to apply. And so establishing that as our foundational motivation. And then briefly coming back to the body to anchor our attention there. Still breathing naturally, still allowing this field of energy to expand and contract with each inhalation and exhalation. And then slowly transitioning to the space around us as we conclude this practice. Thank you. Thank you for joining me in this meditation. And I'm just going to reactivate the slides uh, for today's session. I do love a good slide, partly because it allows me to present the material in a more coherent manner, which is especially helpful when we're talking about definitions and numbered lists. And in our previous session, which is now available on the Dharma Collective's uh, YouTube channel, we talked about quite a few of those, quite a few numbered lists, quite a few definitions. So let's, let's first revisit some of them. And um, just to mention what we talked about last time, I did talk about some of my personal roots uh, or some of my personal streams of inspiration related to the whole domain of Vikudharma, Dharma. And I did talk about some of the systems of practice within the Buddhist tradition in general and more specifically the Tibetan Buddhist tradition that can serve as a powerful source of information, inspiration, ideas, and so forth with regards to this entire domain of environmental thinking as it pertains to the Dharma or, or the domain of thinking that has to do with the Dharma as it pertains to environmental thinking. So either way is of, of viewing it would absolutely be valid. And this is where we enter the whole concept uh, or <laughs> a term, Vikudharma Dharma itself. Uh, many people know that there's a wonderful book by David Loy uh, named Eco Dharma. And uh, yet, <laughs> unless I'm completely mistaken, 
the book itself does not contain a specific definition for this term, which is actually quite interesting because some people get a tiny bit confused by it and um, ask genuinely valid questions about whether ecodharma is a new form of dharma, a new movement in, within the dharma. Is it a new system of practice that would be completely different from everything that the existing traditions, the Sanskrit and the Pali traditions, uh, or the various branches of Theravada across multiple countries, different branches of Mahayana and so forth across different countries. So the ecodharma is a completely new thing unrelated to all of that, sort of like a new religious movement in a way, or a secular movement, a philosophical movement. And it's not that really, at least not in the way that I've been exploring it, uh, and certainly not in the way that I've been explaining it. Nikodharma is just a way of looking at the Dharma that has already been in existence for 2,500 years at least, but asking very specific questions when we look at that Dharma, questions that have to do with really two major things. One is how do the Dharmic ideas presented originally by the Buddha and then expanded upon by other great practitioners, the great yoginis, the great yogis, the great uh, masters, uh, philosophers, thinkers, and so forth. How do all those ideas pertain to our relationship with the natural world? And how do they, how can they help us preserve the natural world and therefore protect us all from essentially extinction? And the flip side of that is also how can these uh, profound ideas teach us to receive benefit from the natural world, not benefit that would be derived from uh, sort of sucking it dry, you know, leaving it empty because we've extracted all the natural resources, we've taken all the wood, we've taken all the oil, we've taken everything, and then we've consumed it and has nothing left. Not in that regard, but how can nonviolent ways of connecting to the natural world enhance our inner well-being and strengthen our spiritual practice so these two questions how can our contact with nature help our well-being and then how can our profound inner well-being support us in protecting the natural world they are in their own way already the two planes of ecodharma or the yin and yang of it the two facets of it um and yet in this case we're expanding on that to talk about the three planes of ecodharma which would be related to working on the personal level where we explore the concept of personal well-being and we start perceiving ourselves as sort of an environment in, in which we can be environmentally friendly and wise and balanced in the way that we are dealing with the system that is our mind, the system that is our body. Then we can talk about the communal level and that's our topic for today and in that we can think about our human communities, but then we can go beyond just the human species, leaving behind some of our anthropocentricity. Anthropocentricity, our, our fixation on just the human species is the pinnacle of existence. And we can think about other types of beings. And this is where in the traditional presentation of the Buddhist teachings, and uh, I say that with the greatest possible respect, because that is the way in which I've been trained, and that is the way in which I practice, um, in the traditional presentation of the Buddhist teachings, this would include also many types of beings that are for us as quote unquote Westerners, something of a mystery. So it is not just about animals, uh, birds, fish, you know, uh, beings living in the water, uh, or also not just bacteria and so forth. It's also other types of beings with bodies made of other configurations of elements, which is a very interesting topic, at least from an anthropological point of view, even if we don't accept the existence of such beings, uh, or even if we don't have a curious doubt or some level of curiosity about their potential existence, that's fine. We can at least have a certain level of respect towards traditional worldviews that absolutely do take the existence of such beings very seriously and then explore the potential implications for our spiritual life, for our health, for our mental health, for our communal well-being and so forth. So that's a thing that we will talk about briefly today. And then beyond that, there's just the global level of, okay, global plane of 
our activity that has to do with um, preserving the natural environment, preventing forest fires, making wise legal decisions about uh, you know, fracking or not fracking, extracting oil or not extracting oil, um, producing green energy in various ways and so forth. And that concerns actually many, many levels of activity, starting with our humble attempts at following the recycling regulations properly and enthusiastically, and going towards the biggest decisions made on the planet, which are um, somewhat unfortunately or very unfortunately, mostly in the hands of legislators and big corporations, which are not particularly interested in preserving, in putting and prioritizing um, sustainability over immediate profits. And yet we can avoid losing hope by focusing on what's doable, focusing on the principle of interdependence and thinking, well, what can be done on that global level, even now, even at the level of resources available to me? And the play, the interplay between the three, personal, communal, which includes the spiritual, uh, so-called spiritual ecology, and um, global, the interplay between the three is something that actually makes this entire presentation a source of sustainable inspiration in that sometimes the best we can do is focus on the personal. And sometimes that's actually something that we need to do very urgently because it's precisely because of lack of personal well-being that we desperately burn out in our attempts to preserve the uh, planet, right? We are really trying to show up for problems that have a very global dimension to them. And we're failing at showing up effectively because we are not truly resourced with regards to our mental well-being. Well, how do we obtain that resource? Uh, how do we obtain that boundless amount of inner strength in the force of in the face of adversity and here adversity would refer to these global environmental challenges one idea that comes from these traditional teachings is that this is where we can develop that energy that enthusiasm that stability that sustainability that concentration that focus that resolve by practicing the dharma which is then defined, for example, as a way of viewing reality, a way of engaging with reality that brings a last, lasting and meaningful sense of well-being. Or a more formal interpretation of the Dharma stemming from the meaning of the Sanskrit root is that Dharma is something that keeps us away from suffering. So eco-Dharma then is just a way of looking at the dharma in general and that does not only has it doesn't have to be specifically buddhist dharma there are many many different types of dharma including the dharma of course the hindu dharma and jain dharma uh, and sikh dharma but beyond that it's absolutely a dharmic component to secular humanism it's absolutely a profusion of dharma in christianity and in islam and in judaism and so forth so any system of ethical thinking and uh, psychological or spiritual practice that can keep us away from mental anguish and from committing negative actions that are harmful to ourselves and others, any system of that nature can be validly labeled as the Dharma. And then within that, we would be able to talk about the Dharma as presented by the Buddha or inspired by the Buddha. That's the Buddha, that's Buddha Dharma. But we could, would also be able to talk about many other Dharmas as well. And uh, when we view them through this lens of environmentalism, then they become eco-dharmas, and we can then have a very positive discussion about the different facets of eco-dharma within Buddhism, within Christianity, within the Hindu tradition, and so forth. But because my own primary training has been in the Buddhist tradition, and specifically in the Indo-Tibetan lineage of Tibetan tradition, that's how I'm trying to present some of the idea that might belong to this entire domain. And this is uh, where uh, we have con considered that there are different levels of well-being, different types of well-being that are described in the Buddhist tradition, some of them were transient and coming from outer types of stimulation, for example, sensory stimulation, and some of them were stable 
a more sustainable coming from the depths of our being, coming from our ability to rest in our positive qualities and the best qualities of our heart and mind. And um, in the Greek terminology, these are described as the hedonic and eudaimonic well-being. And of course, there's also um, a, a, uh, similar terms in Buddhism itself. So dewa, the happiness of this world, uh, worldly happiness. That's something that comes from the outside, from outer stimulation. So right now, as I'm sipping tea and I'm enjoying the flavor of this tea uh, and the aroma of it as well. So there's the enjoyment of smell, the enjoyment of taste, um, the aesthetic enjoyment of just having a nice cup to drink from and just the pleasant thought that I am in a relatively safe environment right now, which is not always the case uh, and very often not the case for so many of us if we belong to the marginalized communities or we're currently in a war zone. You know, just all of that combines into some moments of pleasure that I'm experiencing. And it's absolutely valid. It's a beautiful and important part of happiness without which it would be very difficult for me to be doing all of this quote-unquote spiritual business. It would be very difficult for me to be talking about eco-dharma. It would be difficult for me to be studying the Buddhist tradition and meditate. Uh, it would be difficult for me to practice, to meditate, to share, to discuss, to contemplate, so forth. I do need a certain level of sustenance that comes from this worldly happiness. So there's nothing trivial about it necessarily. But this worldly happiness is indeed transient. It is indeed unsustainable in that each specific expression of it would be gone. The pleasure of drinking tea makes way for other types of pleasure or just dissipates. So actually, if I had to drink three liters of this or like a giant, giant jug of tea, over time, my momentary pleasure would turn into strong dissatisfaction. That would not be at all uh, pleasant to me anymore. But even if I didn't have to torture myself like that, we all know, well, these outer things are not always exciting. And yet, that's the working hypothesis here, there is potentially another dimension of well-being that could very slowly be uncovered or cultivated. And that would be present with us even when there's no outer stimulation. And also, even when the outer stimulation has an unpleasant nature, an unpleasant character, pleasant, an unpleasant tone to it. So if we do cultivate this inner well-being, which is so important for doing anything in a sustainable manner, um, including our activism, we would be relying on an, a potentially inexhaustible source of joy, bliss, clarity, stability, ease, and so forth, while trying to make our way through a very, very difficult world, the world that we live in, which obviously presents us with so many challenges, including challenges related to our natural environment. So that eudaimonic well-being, samyak sukha, satsukha, genuine well-being, authentic well-being, is ours to explore. And it is something that we need to explore. And as we're exploring it, we can start taking an environmental stance on it in that we can look at our own body and our own mind as fields of energy, environment, environments, right? They're not unlike the natural world in that our body is a very complex system with a trillion different elements that are in very complex relationships to each other. And the main thing that we can do with regards to our body is to maintain the natural equilibrium that makes the system relatively sustainable. So that's an idea that is in very general terms explored in some of the traditional healing systems of the world, including, for example, the Ayurvedic system, and the traditional Tibetan medicine and so forth, which is not at all to say that we should all jump into just that and completely ignore the allopathic Western medicine as we know it, because of course we know there's so many very important things that we can um, find to be beneficial in the quote-unquote modern medicine that we're relying on. 
so it's not at all about um, simply relying on the more traditional healing systems, but we can still potentially derive a lot of benefit from the attitude towards the body and a balanced existence of the body that these systems explore. I have myself uh, benefited a lot from traditional Tibetan medicine, not just in the periods where I was living in Tibetan communities in Nepal and India, but also when I was somewhere else, but did go to a Tibetan doctor for dealing with specific chronic problems that I had. And quite a few of the suggestions that the Tibetan doctor would give me, in addition to multiple herbal pills and powders and so forth to be taken internally, many of the suggestions would have to do with reestablishing a balanced state within my body as an energetic system by following specific dietary ideas, by uh, practicing specific principles related to my lifestyle and uh, so forth. For example, uh, I would receive suggestions related to my sleep, the amount of sleep that I personally need, the rhythms of sleeping that I would need, or suggestions related to specific meditation practices that I might do that would enhance this function of my body or that function of my body and so forth. So working with this as I would with any sort of complex system introducing different elements to that system to manipulate it in a way, but to manipulate it only in as much, only in a way that would be necessary to bring the system to greater equilibrium. Because in the long run, the only thing I can do is remove everything that's obstructing the natural sustainability of this system and let it rebalance itself. And then it just flows smoothly from there, as long as I've been able to remove all the obstacles. The same idea with our mind. If I was, if I want to attain a greater de degree of mental stability, clarity, if I want to gradually make the levels of depression, anxiety, and so forth that I experience more manageable, and eventually, if I want to overcome those states, it would be beneficial for me to connect to once again this idea, this image, this concept of nat natural sustainability, natural equilibrium, in which I just remove the toxins from the mind. I remove the unnecessary types of activity that are turning the flow of my mental energy into something toxic. So it's almost as if my mind was a river and there was poison flowing into that river from the nearby factories. And what are those factories? My habits of rumination, for example, or my toxic maliciousness towards this person or that person, or my insatiable craving towards that object and this object. So it's for that reason that um, some of the afflictive mental states that we have are described in the traditional Buddhist teachings as poisons. And it starts with the three poisons of ignorance, aversion, and craving attachment, but then it is expanded to encompass more of those poisonous attitudes that we might gradually, through proper training, Remove. Why? Because they were literally originally pouring poison into the river that is our mental energy, that is the energy of our awareness. But by just removing that pollution, by stopping the production of polluting agents, and they have to be constantly reproduced by the mind to keep going. By removing that, we are able to arrive at a state in which the waters of our mind becomes perfect, become perfectly balanced perfectly clear, perfectly luminous, self-illuminating, and therefore full of joy, bliss, and so forth, all these states that we might be looking for. And the strategy that the Buddha suggests primarily to help us establish mental equilibrium and mental well-being, even though there would be also an effect on the uh, way our body functions, is by following this threefold system of ethical practice, mainly revolving around nonviolence, Samadhi, which includes practices for cultivating single-pointed concentration, but also practices for enhancing the positive qualities of our heart, loving kindness, compassion, and so forth. And in general, just means all the activity that we undertake in order to purify and balance the way in which our awareness flows. So samadhi itself can have that a, a sense of mental gatheredness. 
we gather this energy, we purify it, we refine it so that it can flow in a balanced, sustainable way. And then once we have established a certain level of laser-like clarity with regards to the way our attention flows, our awareness flows, we use that clarity to truly understand the nature of reality, the nature of our own self, the nature of our own mind, the nature of outer objects that we perceive. And that's done by means of insight practices, practices for cu cultivating our mental function of discerning intelligence, or prajna, pragya, depending on which Sanskrit pronunciation system we use. So brought together these three practices, these three systems of practice help us establish greater and greater levels of eudaimonic well-being. But in applying all of them, we're once again perceiving our mind as a complex system. So then we apply the same systems thinking to and this holistic vision of physical and mental well-being. That's an important concept here as well, because in the traditional healing systems, India, China, and Tibet, the body is seen as a system, the body is seen as a system that is constantly going some sort of out of balance, but to be healthy needs to stay in a balanced state. And the things that might get out of balance are, for example, the three humors, three dosha, um, wind, bile, and phlegm, or the five elements of earth, fire, air, water, and space. These are very important for Ikadharma, obviously, because the outer world around us also consists of the five elements. Well, that's one way of perceiving it, right? Dissecting it, trying to describe everything there that there is in the natural world. But also within this traditional presentation, which is quite important in the Indo-Tibetan tradition in particular, there's also uh, a way of describing our mind through the lens of the five elements by correlating specific aspects of our mind specific abilities of our mind, specific qualities of our mind with the five elements as seen within our body and as seen in the world around us. And that's just one way of looking at reality, which is what valid and that we can indeed cut up the cake of reality in this way and it would have certain explanatory power and effective and that we can use this way of dividing the cake bringing into our practice and through bringing into our practice establish greater level of balance within our body and greater level of equilibrium within our, within our mind essentially by using the same basic ideas of remove the polluting agents remove the types of activity that bring the elements out of balance re-establish the balance strengthen the balance try to do that by means of practicing non-violence towards your body and mind bodies and minds of others and so forth so same general ideas revolving throughout the buddhist worldview and helping us bringing it all back to a very practical level where we are able to know what to do in each specific situation by being reminded of very simple suggestions the suggestions that are stemming from these definitions and numbered lists and once again the a key idea here is perceiving all of it as a system that needs to be worked with in a complex elaborate way in that if a system is complex our approach to it also needs to be in a way complex but not complex in that it confuses us makes us feel powerless when we face these issues and where we're trying to deal with the systems not at all that it's complex and that usually there's a few things to attend to just that and those things are all given in these numbered lists that we're being presented with. So by working with them, we're able to accomplish certain levels uh, of results. And on the personal level, once again, that would pertain to the well-being of our body and well-being of our mind. That's the internal eco-dharma in a way. And that personal well-being can then indeed be validly enhanced by using the appropriate techniques brought through or brought from the domain of our work with the five elements that's why there are these practices in which sometimes and that's one practice that we explored last time or started talking about last time there is a practice in which we simply come to a natural environment we rest in that natural environment and by simply resting there but opening ourselves up to the expressions of the five elements we can experience more profound states of well-being 
not necessarily just because there is magic in the trees and the mountains and the streams of water and so forth, not just that. It's not something magical streaming from the outside in, even though there sometimes is that concept as well. There is prana contained in these expressions of the natural elements. That, that is something that is explained in both the Hindu uh, Dharma teachings in some cases, and also in the Buddhist Dharma teachings as well. There is a sort of level of energy contained within everything that exists. But it's not just that from this point of view. A powerful point here is that simply being around these expressions of the natural world and resting with them in a state which would combine ideally stillness of the body, silence of the speech, and spaciousness of our mind, we're allowing a similar level of equilibrium to establish itself internally on the level of our mind and on the level of our body. And that practice in itself is sometimes described in the most, some of the most advanced teachings uh, in the Buddhist uh, tradition and also in the Bun tradition, the indigenous tradition of Tibet, which kind of in some, in some regards mirrors the Indo-Tibetan Buddhist tradition and in some regards is completely unique and authentically valid on its own without any need to compare it to the Buddhist tradition. So there's a little bit of that uh, as well, just allowing it all to balance itself by resting with an already in its own way, without it, at least when humans are not intervening, balanced state on the outer level. And that's all as it, and that's sort of some of the things that pertain to this uh, level of personal well being and how that can be en enhanced by us interacting with the outer elements or just working with internal systems directly. That's also, of course, a thing. To expand on that, we could use some very special practices contained in the Buddhist tradition and the Bun tradition as well, in which to strengthen the physical well being or the mental well being, we would be inviting the healing and balancing energy from the outer world. Some people view those practices as almost having a shamanistic nature to them. And actually some teachers, including Denzin Wanga Rinpoche, who is a very important modern teacher from the Bimpa tradition, they just refer to those practices as being the shamanic or shamanistic level of uh, Bimpa practice or of Buddhist practice before we progress into more internal levels, more philosophical levels, um, of meditation practices and ritual practices and so forth. So we would have, for example, practices in which we imagine that the energies or the elements flow into our being. They mix with the internal energies already contained within our body. We recite, we recite special mantras that symbolize in terms of the syllables of which they uh, consist. They'd symbolize the energies and the properties of the elements. And then eventually we would rest in this renewed sense of inner equilibrium. Those practices absolutely exist. Sometimes they're integrated into other types of meditation. For example, they form a large part of practices associated with Waitara, who is a very beloved and a very important meditation deity within um, Indo-Tibetan tradition, representing the qualities of wisdom, merit, and longevity brought together. Uh, and sometimes a more um, simplified versions of these practices or secularized versions of these practices are also these days being taught um, in a more general context without necessarily being labeled as Buddhists. Um, Tulkutondu Prempeche has some wonderful books on that uh, topic, and I know that even Chandra did a whole course, the Dharma Collective, on one of those books, I think, was Boundless Healing. And uh, that book contains a lot of practices of that nature, enhancing inner well-being through inviting the inspiring power of the five elements uh, to work on our internal systems. But then we progress to the communal level. And once again, the main thing to keep in mind, in addition to the triad of shila, samadhi, prajna, uh, pragya, uh, the ethical restraint or the ethical discipline, mental gatheredness, and then discerning intelligence. In addition to that, one major thing to keep in mind is this type of perception related to systems, viewing our communities and the different uh, systems of social interaction to which we belong as, once again, complex webs of interdependence that can be affected in various ways, positively and negatively, by us as beings who participate in those systems, but can especially be affected positively 
and with sufficient results in an effective manner if we attend to the vital points of those systems. That's once again a, a very Indo-Tibetan idea. In general, in many practices within the Indo-Tibetan tradition, the invitation is to identify the vital points, to apply pressure to them, or to pierce them, and then to attain a certain result. So for example, there are practices uh, related to some very advanced yogas in which we would identify the vital points in our subtle nervous system. We would work with those very skillfully, and that would bring out a complete, or that would bring about a complete transformation in the way in which our mind is currently functioning, and would also bring a very profound shift in the ways our inner energies flow. Then there are practices in which we would identify the weak points within our afflictions. We would notice how our afflictive mental states are especially easy to overcome if we apply pressure to this point within them or that point within them. And then that's exactly what we do. So it's in a way, in a, way a very um, obvious idea, but not at all obvious necessarily if we're thinking about social change, because sometimes, especially when we get overpowered or we get overwhelmed and we just think about the complexity of issues related to environmentalism and so forth, or the complexity of social issues, issues related to social justice, um, inclusivity, diversity, you know, overcoming races, racism and different types of xenophobic behavior and thinking with, we just get overwhelmed because it seems like there's not that many people interested in bringing about profound change or willing to challenge their beliefs, their behavior and so forth. So in a way, it all seems a bit hopeless. And maybe it is, but this is where great Buddhist masters, including Tonkapa, a founder of the Gilok tradition within the Indo-Tibetan um, stream of the Dharma, would invite us to once again think about in systems of interdependence, web of webs of interdependence. And so there's a quote from Tonkapa here somewhere, translated by Tupton Jinpa in this case, and that's from his brilliant poem called Dependent Arising a Praise of the Buddha, which is a system, which is a praise that he wrote for the Buddha's qualities. And that was written so brilliantly that uh, some of the of his contemporaries thought that it probably was composed in India, probably by the great master Nagarjuna, because there's no way that a Tibetan could have written that. And then they learned that it was Tsongkhapa who wrote it. So a little quote from there. Once again, it's Tupton Jinpa's translation. Of all Buddha's deeds, his words were the greatest, and they were words of dependent arising. So, of course, the italics here in mind. Uh, let the wise, therefore, remember him this way. So if we think about everything of which we are a part, including these communal systems, as webs of interdependence, which have their own vital points that we could apply pressure to, and if we think of, about these webs of interdependence as dependent arising in terms of causes and effects, and also that some of them only exist because we conceptually believe that they exist, everything starts becoming a bit less hopeless than it originally used to. It's especially interesting to observe in the domains of politics, for example, because uh, as a person who had to escape his own country because some leaders of that country truly believe in the concept of geopolitics, I'm constantly um, fascinated by the fact that the so-called geopolitics do not exist outside of humans simply believing in this completely artificial conceptual construct, which wouldn't exist if people didn't believe for it to exist. You know, uh, It's simply our belief in this bunch of made up concepts about regions of influence and so forth that leads to big wars being waged, people's lives being destroyed and so forth. But if at some point we said, oh, well, it's all made up then the whole thing would be completely dissipated, uh, would completely dissipate like a dream. And so in a similar manner, the way in which we conceptualize some of these webs of interdependence of which we are a part plays a very large role in our ability to change them and transform them. That's one of the major types of interdependence as presented originally by the Buddha then expounded upon by such masters as Nagarjuna and Tsongkhapa and many, many others. So how do we apply that to this domain of communal eco-dharma? One way is to first look at this triad of systems analysis. Um, 
that is an approach in which we, uh, that's actually an approach that comes from academia and might be familiar to some of you, uh, but it's very simple. It's one of the most simple ways of performing systems analysis in academia. Whatever system we're looking at, we can describe it, describe it by thinking of its components, the properties of those components, and the relationships between those components. So let's give a very simple example. This would be very helpful, perhaps. A specific group of workers, a specific company, let's say, a tiny company, a bakery that has five employees, consists of those five employees. One of them might be, I don't know, the accountant. One of them might be the quote-unquote boss and so forth. So these are the components, the five people that the company consists of. Then each of those five people would have their own properties. This one has that level of education. This one has that level of skill. You know, they would have different qualities, emotional habits, traumatic conditioning, uh, communication skills, and so forth. So if we describe them in that manner, we would already understand a lot about the overall dynamic that the company has. But in addition to that, it would then be important to describe the relationships that exist between them. And so in some cases, that would be a relationship of pure hatred or a relationship of genuine love, a relationship of constructive collaboration or a relationship of healthy or unhealthy competition and so forth. And that would also be, we would also be able to say, well, everyone in this company is sort of seen as equal to everyone else, or by contrast, no, people are seen to be very different, perceived to be very different from each other. These two employees are seen as the bosses and these three employees as you know, the lower class and so forth. So just describing those relationships, sometimes very fleeting and mercurial, sometimes very stable in their nature, it would already give us such a profound understanding of the overall dynamic. So if, if somebody did ask us to perform a description, to do a research on a specific group of beings, by just writing a little bit on these three points, we would under, already understand so much. And we would actually be able to provide our client with a document that gives some insights into the workings of this specific system. Similarly, we don't have to necessarily perform a very detailed analysis when we think about larger communities. So we can take a specific country as a community or a specific town or a specific city, and we can just think, well, let's say we have 70,000 people living in this town. It's a lot, but it, it, it's not 14 or 18 million, which is, for example, the number of people that supposedly live in modern day Moscow, about 16 million people. That's quite a lot, right? But even if we were talking about 16 million people, we would then be able to say, if we're talking about ecodharma specifically, well, how many of these people, and that would be a description of properties already, how many of these people do we think care about the natural environment? How many of these people have access to information about the environment? How many of these people have had education uh, related to the natural environment and so forth? How many of these people truly compassionate or have been encouraged to have compassion, have learned about compassion, have received an emotional intelligence training, yada, yada, yada. We can ask all these questions and give some answers, provide some answers, find some answers. And then similarly with relationships, we could identify specific dynamics that exist within the set group of people. And of course, the types of dynamics that we, we, we would be identifying would depend on the specific type of research that we're performing in that are we identifying dynamics that are related to racial justice or environmentalism or you know recycling alone or level of safety that communities and people experience and so forth we can have so many questions about the system and we can have, find so many answers but then we will be able to see any system including this system can be changed, let's say that's the imaginary community of 70,000 people, can be changed if we start pouring things into the system by using appropriate channels of distribution. And this primarily would refer to 
things like education. This is why the Dalai Lama emphasizes the role of education in us all having a positive future potentially. But it's not just education because it's also culture, media, social media, very powerfully. People watched many, many, uh, someone just came out with a statistic that showed how many hours of Netflix content people watched and how many hours of TikTok content people watched last year. And Netflix is way behind TikTok for very obvious reasons. So TikTok has become a major system of cultural transformation on a distributing positive information or negative information, information that is completely out of touch with reality, or that is really teaching us to understand reality in profound ways. All of that is possible. So we look at all those different ways of pumping information into the system, pumping positive qualities into the system. And this is where we can start asking ourselves, well, within these communities to which I belong, and those can be our personal community, our professional communities, our familial communities, right? Those also matter a great deal. This can be our spiritual communities. Once again, that's a very important conversation to have as well. How in touch are those with the ideas of social justice, mental well-being, mental health, racial justice, and so forth? Uh, and then our geographic communities of our towns, municipalities, you know, cities, regions, countries, continents hemispheres, and then the entire planet. What beneficial qualities are already strongly present within my communities and which can still be strengthened? So I didn't want to word it in a way that would suggest that some qualities are completely missing. That's never true. We're never in a community that completely lacks in compassion or completely lacks in, uh, let's say, um, wisdom, completely lacks in generosity. That's simply not possible because we all have basic goodness. And so to a certain degree, these foundational basic qualities are always present, more or less. They can be pre present in a very, very small way, and they can be present in a very powerful way because some communities do make the conscious effort to strengthen their compassion and to manifest their compassion. Some communities do go out of their way to strengthen the quality of wisdom, to expand that wisdom, to project that wisdom to the rest of the world, and so forth. So we can ask ourselves, which of the quintessential positive qualities that are needed to protect the natural environment and to establish those other positive goals are already present in the communities to which I belong. So let's just take a moment and consider that. And um, if you want to share anything on that topic in the chat, that would be absolutely lovely uh, or fine, at least, you know, it depends on whether you have the inspiration, but just thinking for a moment, the communities, the different communities to which I belong, what qualities do they already display in a powerful, obvious way? And what positive qualities are not as present, but I would love for them to see flourishing a bit more so that everyone can benefit from those qualities. And this is once again where, of course, the specific lists of what is a positive quality would be different in different traditions. The Hindu Tibetan tradition and the Sanskrit tradition of Buddhism in general quite often essentialize all the positive qualities under the two major headings of wisdom and compassion. So clarity of vision and perception, that's on the wisdom side, and then kindness, heart, warm-heartedness, benevolence, compassion proper, and so forth on the compassion side. It's two major branches that are very, very profoundly interconnected, but have a somewhat different function. One is to see reality clearly. The other is to act as if things are interdependent, which they are, obviously. So we could think just those general headings, or we can think of very specific qualities that come to mind. And for each one of us personally, different types of qualities would be at the forefront of our perception in different periods of our life, because sometimes we're extremely sensitive towards generosity. Sometimes we're extremely sensitive towards kindness or lack of kindness. Sometimes we really appreciate the quality of justice. Sometimes we really appreciate the quality of compassionate care and so forth. There are many, many wonderful qualities to explore. And uh, yet if something is coming right now to your mind, just to voice that, you know, to, for all of us to serve as wit witnesses to that. Yeah, just you can just drop those words into the chat if you want. And then um, the other 
question here, which is also for us to explore, to consider, to contemplate, is how can I affect the flow, the distribution, the spread, the growth of these positive qualities in different ways? So let's say I've just said that a quality that is really present in my communities is courtesy. I would say that's very generally true. Right now I'm in the UK. People are extremely polite in most cases. My professional communities are really courteous with me, with others, with people that attend the events, with people that organize the events. So I'm really ex experiencing a lot of courtesy all around me. And courtesy is a form of kindness, uh, or at least it can be an it can be an expression of kindness. It can sometimes stem from our attachment to our reputation and the way that people perceive us, which is then is not as good as if it were as if it were flowing from genuine benevolence. But still, it's not bad. It's never bad to have to be courteous, and um, so that's a quality that I'm very strongly witnessing around me right now. But then I'd be able to say, oh well, what am I lacking right now? Well, I would say. Enthusiastic effort is a quality about, you know, inner transformation is a quality that I would just would like to witness more in myself and the communities of practice to which I belong, like sort of sustainable effort, sustained effort, maybe, because I just had a class today uh, and because it was adver un under advertised, no one showed up for that one. Um, I wasn't sad or anything, but because I already allocated that time and showed up for the appointment and then no one showed up from the participant side, yada, yada, yada. Like, okay, well, actually, if at least 10 people showed up, that would have been a very meaningful way to invest our time. But they didn't. But, you know, what to do? But if I were to invite something, that's what I would invite. And then a very valid question to ask myself, well, how can I affect that flow of sustained effort with regards to something that is positive, constructive, virtuous from my own side? Well, and then I can think about all the ways in which that class could have been advertised, promoted, in terms of explaining the benefits of the sad practice, telling people how they can benefit from it uh, by participating directly or by means of a recording, and so forth. So, there's so many things to do, right, that I could explore so many ways to reach that goal, so many vital points to hit from my side to affect the overall dynamic in the community. Because I know if I were able to convince people to participate in that class, then by means of them participating in that class, that would have affected the quality of their life in many powerful ways. Because the practice that we were about to do actually is quite important in its ability to sustain our mental well-being, to support profound levels of rest, relaxation, stability, clarity, and so forth. So strategic thinking, right? Systems thinking. Okay, some responses here. Care for economic well-being is very present in my community. Okay, you know, and that's not often, often the case and not always the case. So that's in its own way very powerful uh, because some communities completely lack that. They lack that idea, that concept or access to the necessary, to information on that topic sometimes because of historical marginalization or being historically denied access to that, sometimes through just paying too much attention to other aspects of well-being, but ignoring the economic sustainability. Just There's many, many factors of that nature. And so for some communities, that would not be the case. And oh, that in itself, when practiced in a healthy manner, can be very powerful, right? Not quite sure. Uh, next one here. I'm not sure how could I affect such qualities, for example, compassion, maybe by own example, or maybe by advertising some free compassion course. Well, exactly. It starts with a personal example. And actually, because there are say, such things as neural mirroring, uh, or also emotional contagion, uh, because being in the presence of a compassionate person inspires us to be more compassionate. Because from the Buddhist point of view, radiating compassion to others helps them activate their basic goodness and inspires them to progress towards compassion or many considerations like that. That in itself is already such a powerful thing. And in fact, when we think about our own life, we would always, often, that's certainly my experience with 
chaplaincy and hearing people talk about these things, we would often think of the people who were compassionate towards us, who were a presence of compassion in our life. We think about them and we're inspired by them and we often reference them for many decades after our original meeting. A truly compassionate teacher, truly compassionate grandparent, truly compassionate spiritual teacher, truly compassionate nurse, maybe. There's so many people who would be sources of compassion for us personally, but they affect us in very profound ways. And that type of influence stays with us. So similarly, us becoming a beacon of compassion is a very powerful thing. But then on a much more practical level, yes, we can absolutely advertise free courses about compassion. We can buy a couple of secular books about compassion and give them out as you know, coffee table books to people or just as gifts. Doesn't necessarily mean they're going to read it immediately, but sometimes people do. You never know. Uh, or you might know to a certain degree, and then it's about strategic thinking. It's about a be, being a little bit cunning with how exactly we spread the culture of compassion, how we create the culture of compassion. Because we all have a platform, and the way to which we use that platform, however small or large it might be, would affect our ability to promote these qualities in powerful ways. Um, Lots of generosity, friendliness, and an emphasis on mental, physical well-being in my community. Well, see, there's so many points to rejoice. And at the same time, sort of the second part of this question is to consider, well, which qualities can still be strengthened? And what types of cultural influence are available to me? And once again, it can be something as simple as giving someone, giving someone a book about something specific or making sure our children watch short videos about the importance of compassion and cultivating it, right? Or simply being a beacon of compassion, loving kindness ourselves. The Buddhist tradition certainly believes, the, the, the traditional Buddhist tradition, you know, and it's, for example, forms practiced across Theravada countries and countries where the Sanskrit tradition is predominant. There's certainly a strong emphasis on, an, on the effect that a powerful yogini or yogi might have on the area around them. And that sort of brings us closer to this idea of spiritual ecology. So even if someone is just simply practicing in a cave because of some profound influence that they're extending to others, just by having that good vibe, there's something transformative that is going on. I can certainly attest to that because as an interpreter, as a Dharma interpreter, I've had the incredible privilege of being in the presence of some absolutely outstanding yogis and yoginis, most of them of Tibetan origin or Himalayan origin at least. And they have been very palpably full of compassion and loving kindness and so forth, and very obviously able to affect the people around them. So we can have different theories about how exactly does that work. Is it simply emotional contagion, right, happening through mirror neurons and all of that? Is it something related to the more um, mysterious domain of prana, vital energy, and so forth? Is it just their facial expression? that is so profoundly kind and compassionate that people truly change in their presence and become much more open, much more humble, much more happy, much more joyful, sometimes blissful in their presence. Many different ways of describing and explaining it, right? Depending on our philosophical views about the nature of the mind, the nature of reality and so forth. But there's something that we can witness in all of that. So once again, not to at all downplay the importance and the power of our own compassionate presence when we do become a presence of compassion in this world, not to downplay the importance of our own wisdom when we do cultivate that wisdom. And that would, would and will be affecting our communities, professional communities, personal communities, and so forth. Why? Because our communities are systems, systems of interdependence. Those systems have vital points to which we can apply pressure in a positive, in a very positive manner. Pressure as in, like we can do something that would have potential effects. Sometimes completely life-changing. To be very honest, um, at the moment, I, I was just discussing this with my 
Russian speaking friends for multiple countries actually, uh, who have been um, somewhat benefited from all the content that the communities to which I belong have been able to put out um, on the global net over many, many years. And uh, we have by now accumulated about 300,000 hours of watched content on our main Russian language YouTube channel. So people have been watching these translated talks with different Dharma luminaries and uh, have been watching these guided meditations, using these guided meditations and so forth, uh, workshops, all of that, just recordings from multiple years, about nine years of, I guess, online activity, 300,000 hours of people, like of watch content. And it all started with one completely insignificant recording of a talk that I was asked to give in a college just talking about Buddhism in general. And no one ever expected that that would have some effect. And we really didn't really believe in that recording when we were putting it up. We didn't really think anyone was particularly going to watch it. But then it accumulated tens of thousands of views and led to this entire network of Dharma content that is now available to people. And it was impossible to predict that uh, unless you were clairvoyant. but but it happen. You never know. And another example, uh, I was listen recently listening to a podcast in which Sharon Salzberg, who's a very well-known teacher of loving kindness and insight meditation in the United States, uh, was in conversation with John Kabat-Zinn, who is sometimes referred to as the, I don't know, the father of the mindfulness movement, uh, or the stepfather of the mindfulness movement, at least. So of course, mindfulness practices were not created by him. They came for many generations of lineage holders across multiple Asian communities. And there needs to be a profound sense of gratitude for all of that. Otherwise, we're falling, in, falling into the trap of very colonial attitudes towards the Dharma and where it came from. But John kabat certainly had a huge impact on popularizing mindfulness and also doing medical research on the efficiency of modern mindfulness and how it can affect our physical well-being, our mental well-being, help us with pain and pain management. That's what his latest book is uh, about and so forth. So certainly a very, very influential figure and a student of many of my own teachers, including Chukin Nimrim Bache and many others. So he, when he first attended the Dharma talk, was one of the eight people in attendance. And if you are a teacher who's used to speaking to hundreds of people, which some teachers are. They, every time they give a talk, there's thousands of people showing up or hundreds of people showing up or at least dozens of people showing up. To speak to eight people, sometimes for teachers of that caliber, might seem like, oh, like what a worthless endeavor. You know, like let's just cancel the class and wait until there's a few dozen people showing up. But at that point, the Roshi whose talk uh, John Kabat-Zinn attended as his very first introduction to the Dharma, did not cancel the class, did very, very seriously enter a conversation with just eight people. And it just so happened that one of those eight people eventually became John Kabat-Zinn as we know him. And he's had a huge impact on this world, um, very beneficial impact, very powerful impact. So, you know, not to downplay this efficiency and the strength on the small things that we might do by remembering we have these points of influence and we don't always know what which of the vital points we will get activated, but we need to have the resolve, the intentionality to keep projecting these qualities every which way and also be strategic and tactical about it when possible, but also to you know, invest into everything, a little bit of everything, and then to hope that the culture of which we are a part, for example, the entirety of our culture as it relates to environmentalism, would and will eventually change. So that's once again, system thinking, this thinking of interdependence as applied to our cultural spaces, cultural dimensions, but also the systems of legal regulations, the systems of activism, the systems of work, like what is it that our organization is working on? What are we pouring our energy into? What content do, are we putting out? What posts are we reposting? 
what things are we commenting on and liking and so forth. All of these are different ways of applying effort, applying pressure, applying something, um, some kind of energy to these different domains and these different facets of reality. So with regards to this, there's a completely different way of looking at it that is still very important for the Buddhist tradition. And that is what is in the title for today's conversation. And we're gradually moving towards the end of it is what's described as the spiritual ecology. And this is, uh, I would very gently preface that, is a thing that for some people would once again only have anthropological value because we do live largely in a society that is dominated by the materialist, reductionist worldview. The worldview that has convinced a lot of people that the mind is nothing but an emergent property of the brain, and it does not have its own existential status. The mind is not anything beyond the brain, yada, yada, yada. And I'm not going to dwell on this topic in depth because uh, one of my own primary teachers, Dr. Alan Wallace, has written wonderful books on the topic. And there are, of course, many wonderful thinkers who explore the fallibility of reductionist materialism uh, in many different ways. And Buddhism has its own way of refuting it very powerfully. But that is not necessarily a comfortable conversation sometimes because uh, there are people who are so not okay with refuting uh, a reductionist materialism that they develop their own forms of Buddhism, sometimes labeled as secular Buddhism and so forth, and which are not simply about getting rid of some of the more cultural rituals and so forth. That, that's one way of looking at secular Buddhism, but are specifically about saying, hey, I'm only going to practice Dharma as it relates to my existence as this bag of meat, which will eventually die and there's nothing, not going to be anything left. So I can still use some principles from the Dharma to bring some benefit to my current existence. But beyond that, there's nothing that exists after death. So I'm just going to have hopefully some fun while I'm alive. And that's it. And when the Buddha was talking about such things as rebirth, the existence of mind beyond death, the beginningless and endless nature of the stream of consciousness and so forth. That was just his way of paying homage to the cultural norms of his day, or maybe he didn't really know what he was thinking about, yada, yada, yada. There are many, many people who put out, put forth ideas like that. Not a comment on that in detail, even though as a scholar, uh, or as a student of the Indo-Tibetan tradition, I do believe there's a lot of colonialism in that view. And that is very, very sad in a way. That being said, we absolutely are entitled to our own opinions, and we're also invited to be constantly checking them against the nature of reality. And Buddhism does say that there is a specific sequence of experiments that we can perform to see whether the mind is indeed endless and beginningless. Those mostly have to do with the practices of samadhi. We cultivate single-pointed concentration to a sufficient degree. We would be able to, through very practical experiments, see whether this consciousness has as a flow, as a stream existed before this specific birth, whether it will exist after this specific birth and so forth. One thing that I can say as an interpreter is that uh, who has had the incredible fortune of meeting really, really powerful yogis and yoginis, some of whom spent more than 20 years in single uh, in solitary retreat, some of whom have spent many years in retreat while being in concentration camps and so forth. So really powerful advanced practitioners who have transformed suffering into the path or who have just practiced on the path a lot by sitting in their caves and really meditating in very profound ways that would not be accessible to most of us at this current level of practice that we're trying to perform. And that are then that serves as an inspiration for us. One day, may I be able to the same degree of understanding with regards to the true nature of the mind. One thing that I would say is that not single one of those yogis or yoginis had even the slightest doubt about the fact that consciousness is not simply um, emergent property of the brain, that it does exist in its own way has its own unique nature that is different from the nature of matter, and that this consciousness can be conjoined with different types of materiality. And at the same time, we can just leave that as 
an anthropological description or as something that, oh, what a curious idea, what an interesting idea. It's a working hypothesis also. That's the general limitation of Buddhism. So from this point of view, for traditional Buddhist communities, the world does not simply revolve around humans and human birth and also animal rebirth are not the only types of existence that there are. And within each locality, each region, each area, each, each geographical location, there are not simply humans and animals, but there are also other types of beings. So this is idea that Buddhism certainly very powerfully shares with many different types of indigenous spirituality. And not simply indigenous spirituality, because the Abrahamic traditions constantly make references to invisible beings as well. And not simply angels or demons. There's also kind of all sorts of spirits and ghosts and so forth described even in the Bible or referenced in the Bible. And then in the Quran and similarly in um, other sources that are related to other religious traditions as well. So then what's the deal? Is it simply a projection? of an ignorant mind that wants to believe that natural phenomena are caused by ghosts, whereas in actuality, they're actually caused by laws of physics. Um, no, no, not necessarily. This is where there is uh, a wonderful quote from Tenzin Wang and Rinpoche's book on the five elements um, from the very beginning of that book. So once again, Tenzin Wang Rinpoche is a teacher of the Bunpa tradition, the indigenous spiritual tradition of Tibet that has over centuries come to resemble Indo-Tibetan Buddhism stemming from India very, very closely. Yeah, there's a lot of complementarity between the two. And talking about his own tradition, which would also be true for the Indo-Tibetan tradition of Buddhism, um, he's saying perhaps that dependence, dependence on the natural world and its resources helped our culture, Tibetan culture, like most indigenous cultures, understand the natural world to be sacred and alive with beings and forces, visible and invisible. During Loser, the Tibetan celebration of the new year, we did not drink champagne to celebrate. Instead, we went to the local spring to perform a ritual of gratitude. We made offerings to the Nagas, the water spirits who activated the water element in the area. We made smoke offerings to the local spirits associated with the natural world around us. And the quote continues, beliefs and behaviors like ours evolved long ago and are often seen as primitive in the West. But they are not only projections of human fears onto the natural world, as some anthropologists and historians suggest. Our way of relating to the elements originated in the direct experiences by our sages and common people of the nature of the external and internal elements. Which means, uh, this last bit about external and internal elements, that within this worldview, within this understanding of reality, this gross body of ours that is primarily made of the earth element, it's full of gross elements, it's a chunk of meat, you know, it's a walking bag of meat and bones and so forth. This is not the only type of materiality that potentially exists. There are other types of bodies that are not necessarily accessible to the human eye, but that can be conjoined with a stream of consciousness and would exist, would have their own experiences, would you know, do all sorts of stuff, and including affecting our existence in some ways, affecting our physical health, affecting our mental health, and so forth, but would have a slightly different nature, and yet are not accessible to our current perception because we're not yogis and yoginis, because we have not cultivated the strength of samadhi, because we have not cultivated those types of perception. Some people do possess that type of perception from birth due to unique karmic conditioning. Some, most beings don't. But there's certainly a way of cultivating those types of perception, according to the view of this uh, system. And that is primarily associated, once again, with cultivating profound concentration. And then, if you meet some of the masters who possess that reportedly, like late, late Amazup Rinpoche, who passed away literally a month ago, was a very, very respected Tibetan teacher, Sherpa, ethnically, but a very respected teacher of the Tibetan tradition with many, many Dharma centers that he was overseeing all over the world, 150 different Dharma organizations altogether, uh, give and take. And um, a very profound yogi who was, for, for example, famous for never sleeping, constantly staying in profound meditation, 
teaching very profound dharma, but also very practical dharma on many occasions. So Lama Zip Rinpoche, when he would visit different centers, would just make casual observations about, for example, the presence of a Naga spirit in that tree, or the presence of that specific elemental energy, or that, those specific beings here or there. And when asked about the origins of different physical ailments that some of the students of his suffered, he would say, well, that's connected to this specific type of invisible beings. Do this and that type of practice, and it might help. And it, very often, it did help. I have myself received similar types of advice from him, have followed that advice, and have received a lot of benefit from that. And I've also witnessed him directly um, displaying mind reading, specifically with regards to my mind. Um, and, and that was a, such a unique situation that I have very little doubt that it was specifically that. Because sometimes people say, oh, this teacher read my mind. And they're saying that because a teacher addressed a very common point that everyone asks about, you know, because we all have similar questions, similar doubts, similar concerns when attending a Dharma talk. So it wasn't that at all. It was a very different kind of situation, which I'm not going to go too deeply into just because it's quite personal. But that convinced me quite strongly that, that yes, <laughs> his reputation as a being with profound sensitivity, profound clarity of mind is very well deserved. And so encounters of that nature can convince us somewhat that indeed there is something to it. And there's a quote from a Western writer, Western Buddhist writer, I think she, uh, she certainly spent many years practicing uh, teaching in San Francisco area, Sandy Busher, who wrote a wonderful book about Kuan Yin, uh, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, as in as venerate it in the um, East Asian Buddhist traditions. Um, that's a quote from one of her articles for Tricycle. So many of my Vipassana sisters and brothers are interested only in meditation practice, recoiling from the devotional dimensions of Buddhist engagement. Yet despite our loyalty to our Western materialistic and scientific view, we may come to suspect that reality is actually multidimensional, that vestiges of other worlds sometimes accompany us, that a sacred, sacred embodied presence may be available to us if only we're open to it. This can happen in the meditation hall, in moments of crisis, on the sidewalk of our hometown, anywhere at all. The energy of compassionate caring exists in our world and can be present to us. So these two quotes are about somewhat different things because the one from Tenzin Wangi Rinpoche talks about elemental forces and elemental beings that are sort of seen to be on the same level as us. They're not divinities, these beings. They're just different types of beings, equally deluded in their own ways, but worthy of our respect, care, affection, friendship, and so forth, because we're all in the boat of samsara together. It'd be nice to collaborate, to cooperate, to be nice to each other, to be courteous. That's one thing that's uh, there. And then Sandy Busher's quote is more about beings that have transcended some of the limitations and like the Bodhisattva of Compassion can extend a helping hand to us by allowing us to access sort of higher reality, higher in that it's just closer to the core of our being, closer to the core of our basic goodness. But both of these sort of relate to this idea of the spiritual ecology, ecology which plays a very, very large role in the Indo-Tibetan tradition of practice. So you would have met methods specifically for pacifying the energy of a specific area or affecting the energy of a specific area. And sometimes that would include different types of rituals that are performed to connect to the local spirits and ghosts and so forth, or sometimes practices to affect the spirits connected to one specific individual, and that specific individual is believed to be negatively affected by something of that ghostly or spiritual nature. Sometimes these would be practices that can potentially, in that worldview, affect the flow of prana along the earth, and you would have great masters planting little vases full of sacred materials into the ground to create or affect the vital points in the ground in the earth itself. That's a practice that's common to many indigenous traditions, including that of Tibet. Uh, so you would have all these different practices, different methods. And sometimes, once again, it all boils down to our beliefs, right? Sometimes people would see that as not simply important for our well-being, but also as a very important way of honoring the natural world, because the natural world does not boil down to what's simply the human's can perceive with our eyes and so forth. That's 
obviously the case and that, well, how can our limited beliefs about reality, colonial, Western, fully affected by first the Greco-Roman Judeo-Christian conditioning, and then by the industrialist reductionist view of reality, how can that encompass the totality of all there is? That's a valid question to ask and to contemplate. But beyond that also, it's not just that. It's also a powerful way to honor that reality and to then expand the, the limits of our perception so that we ourselves can experience, not make up, but truly experience what is. With an open mind, we ask the question, well, what can be there beyond the limits of my perception? And that would not be an, unlike the transformation that Ram Dass undergone, right? In, in that originally a Harvard professor, Rachel Alpert, with very, very profoundly Western conditioning and uh, very, very profoundly limiting beliefs about the nature of the psyche, psychoanalyst originally, right? And the nature of the mind and the purpose of our existence and so forth. Then bam, the LSD bomb drops um, in his personal experience. Then bam, meeting a truly realized yogi in India, named Karali Baba, practicing under his guidance and witnessing things that cannot be explained within our standard reductionist worldview and not becoming just wild and mystical about it or completely new age, even though, of course, those are some of the associations that some people might have for Ramdas, but becoming a psychonaut, someone who's interested in exploring these profound levels of reality with an open mind. So that's a thing that can sort of, in a way, interest to some of us as well. And this is where at least that's important to acknowledge, at least from the traditional Buddhist point of view, the domain of Ikudharma cannot be seen as being completely isolated from this entire conversation about these invisible beings and so forth. And yet, of course, if our worldview does not at all include, uh, even with an open-ended question, does not at all implicate the existence of other beings beyond humans, animals, and bacteria, that's fine, you know, that's, that's our worldview. And we have a perfect right to hold on to it, to challenge it, to explore it, to confirm that it's correct or, or discover that it's incorrect and so forth. It's absolutely valid. But it is important, I think, from my point of view, to say that the, certainly the teachings of the Indo-Tibetan Buddhist tradition do include all the, also this domain of Vikadharma. And yet, if it's not meaningful, this sort of quote-unquote spiritual ecology is not does not seem important to us, we still go back to the previous conversation about our communities. These definitely do exist, right? Our spiritual, professional, familial, legal communities, our geographic communities, people probably do exist in our perception, along with animals, fish, you know, and aquatic beings and so forth. So at least we can practice with them. And once again, consider these systems interdep of interdependence in which we exist. And then uh, even if we're not familiar with any other practices for spiritual ecology, you know, all these complex rituals that might be performed in different traditions, certainly a lot of those in Theravada, there is a lot of those practices in the Zen and Chan traditions as well. Multiple, multiple layers and forms of practice specifically for that, for communicating this invisible world around us, because it is seen as important. Even if we're not familiar with any of that, a very foundational practice that still performs that function of strengthening the spiritual ecology or improving the state of the spiritual environment around us, and then also improving the state of the actual environment as in like the material domain of it and the legal regulations around it and so forth, is the practice of loving kindness. Because as many people would remember, the Buddha originally taught this practice when uh, some of the monks who were hoping to do retreat in a forest were bothered by the potential presence of malevolent spirits there. In some versions of the stories, uh, they were bothered by wild animals, but many versions of the story talk about malevolent spirits that were bothering those monks, and then the Buddha taught them this practice of loving kindness. And then there are two interpretations of that story. One interpretation, which is quite modern and reductionist, and so we would see it in modern day sources, you know, mostly in writing in the writings of American authors, quite often from the insight meditation movement. The interpretation is that the monks were just being paranoid, but loving kindness practice removed that paranoia and then they felt safe in the forest 
because there were actually no malevolence birds. The original interpretation is that they were actually malevolent beings, but because loving kindness was extended to them, there was a profound sense of peace that started pervading the entire area. The minds of the monks themselves, yes, but also all these other beings that were already present there, truly, as real to themselves as we are to ourselves. So for us, our existence is real. For those beings, their existence is real. From the point of view of emptiness, none of it is real. From the point of view of interdependence, it is all functional. There is flow of causes and effects. So loving kindness practice kind of very nicely covers all of that. We can do it and it would affect the spiritual ecology, even if we're not particularly strong in our belief of its reality. But when we're doing it, one technical adjustment that can be done is that we think, well, and even if there are these invisible beings, may they also be well and happy. And so since we're at the very end of this um, second installment in the series, let's just spend a few moments, not even minutes, but just a few moments thinking about everything that we've discussed today, including these ideas related to communities, systems, components, properties, relationships, and so forth. And then gathering mentally all of that positive pot potential, all of this effort that we've applied, all of our aspirations, thoughts, insights, and so forth. Gathering it all into one, we can dedicate it to the well-being and happiness of all who live, whether we see them or not. And also dedicating it so that all the systems of which we are a part might become systems uniting wisdom and compassion, wisdom and love. So that greatest possible benefit might be brought to all beings. May it be so. And these are all. The thoughts that I, or some of the thoughts that <laughs> I had on the slides for today, it's probably more to expand upon and think about. But if any of it was of any benefit, I'm incredibly grateful and hoping to see you in the last installment of this series in June. Once again, deep bows of gratitude to Cage for hosting us today and to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Please support the collective with your dana and with your kind attention. That would help us all strengthen wisdom and compassion in this world. And on that note, thank you so much and see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Tempa. Thank you. We have a lot to think thank about. Thank you.